Hey guys, Jim Daniker here with Michael W. Smith. I uh, thought I would take you on a quick tour of my touring rig for fall 2021. Um, we are kind of going back into Michael's career. It, when we started this tour in 2020, uh, I think the first and only show we did was March 12th, and then COVID hit, so we never got to do that tour. So we're picking up where we left off, and as part of the set, we're going all the way back to the early part of Michael's career. We're playing some some old stuff all the way to the new stuff. But because we're doing that, I thought it would be fun to recall um, his keyboard rig from back in the 80s through the early 90s. So that said, I am bringing out Old Faithful, the Yamaha KX88, which is one of the best controllers ever made. It doesn't have any sounds in it. It is just a fantastic piano style weighted keyboard, and it just feels superb to play. Um, so, uh, my rig has evolved a lot through the years. Before I forget, um, a lot of you guys know that I am also a big Roland fan. Um, Roland and Yamaha, to me, are the two top-notch companies. They always have been. They just make great stuff. Um, going back a few years, my rig was kind of the opposite of this. It, instead of being just one keyboard, it was four keyboards, all Roland. And um, But the show was entirely different then, and so it was... Uh, it's hard to explain why I've made the changes I've made, but I go back and forth a lot between the two. Um, so I'm retiring some of my Roland stuff to the studio, which is where I tend to use that stuff more. But on the road, for this tour, it makes the most sense to go back to the Yamaha stuff. And so for that, for the first leg of the tour, I'm using the KX88, which I'm having a blast with because it's so much fun to play. It feels fantastic. However, um, sooner than later, I actually have it out with me. I'm switching to the new YC88, which is, again, it's brand new. And the nice thing about the YC88 is for the first time, it lets me do everything I need all in one keyboard. I've never really had that. For the last, gosh, 10, 15 years, I've used the Yamaha CP300, which is a digital piano. And then on top, I will put uh, a smaller keyboard, usually for organ, centric duties and for the last year that's been the Yamaha YC61 which is fantastic um, and that's got real Hammond style waterfall keys but it has physical draw bars which are a big deal to me because I play a lot of B3 stuff um, so Yamaha just came out with the full-size version of that which is the YC88 it's got 88 piano style keys uh, it actually has wooden sides on the keys it, it, it looks feels great uh, but it also has the eight physical excuse me nine real physical draw bars which is uh, again it's a big deal but for now uh, for the first leg of the tour where we're doing some of the classic material I wanted to bring out the KX88 because it's just a lot of fun so um, yeah uh, I'm gonna flip the camera around and take you on a, a kind of walk through of what I'm using and try and explain why if you have any questions about any of this stuff, feel free to ask in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe because I'm gonna be putting out a lot more content over the next couple months. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically it. Um, one, one other note though, when I started with Michael 26 years ago this fall, um, the rig was vastly different. Now, of course, we can do everything with a laptop. But back then, the rig was the size of a industrial refrigerator. It was 27 rack spaces tall, two racks wide, uh, so that thing probably weighed 800 pounds. And it was full of MIDI modules. Uh, Korg was big at the time, so the O1W series, the Wave Station. Let me see what else that rig had. It had a pair of Akai S1100 samplers. It had a pair of Roland MKS-20 piano modules. It had... Uh, three or four Roland JV-1080 modules with expansion cards. It had two massive Roland line mixers. It had two Yamaha digital line mixers. Um, so that let me kind of take any combination of sound modules and route them to any output because there were three keyboard players on that first tour that I did. So it was endlessly complicated. And it cost a fortune to ship and it needed space on a truck and all that kind of thing. Now it's one controller, one laptop, and it's very simple, very sleek. So in some sense, these, these rig walkthroughs, this one's not gonna be very complicated. There's not much to it, but I love it because it's, it's, um, it's sleek, it's reliable, 
and uh, I can actually do far, far more these days with just a laptop-based system than I ever could back in the old days. So anyway, hope you enjoy this. Again, feel free to ask any questions, and let's get started. Okay, so here is the uh, the main overview of the rig, starting with the controller. It's a 35-year-old Yamaha KX88, which is a fantastic controller. Um, feels absolutely superb. I managed to find one in mint condition, and uh, it really, really is great. And uh, even all these years later, it just, man, it just feels right. Okay, so we've talked about the KX88. Now let's talk about Touch OSC on the iPad. This is an app that lets you create your own custom control panel, uh, whether it's knobs, faders, or buttons, um, that let you do pretty much anything you can imagine. In my case, this is a modified version of the template that comes with Backstage Pass. Um, so you can see here there's 24 program change buttons, which is all I need for a typical show. Um, because some of these are splits and layers and that sort of thing. But I also went further, uh, specifically for, for this particular show, I've got some uh, commands that let me run logic, like start, stop, I can close uh, the current song, I can open a song, I can navigate up and down uh, through the track list, I can go left and right uh, in the finder to pick different files and open them without ever having to come over and, you know, work with a computer. I can do it all right from here. So um, let's see what else. I've also got key commands for previous marker, next marker, um, top of the song, marker one. I can mute and solo tracks if I need to. Um, so yeah, this basically is kind of my remote control for the computer so that I rarely have to turn sideways and interact with this. Um, th so these are the, these are really the three main components. This is the controller, and, and again, in this case, using the KX88 right now. But I will be switching to the YC88 later in the tour. The iPad, which is my remote that you know talks to the computer, and then the computer itself. So let's check that out. Okay. So as for the computer itself, um, it is mainly there to provide my sounds. All of my sounds come from Backstage Pass, which is the custom virtual keyboard environment I built for Mainstage. And uh, it's completely controlled by the iPad, which I've already showed you. And um, it's got all the same stuff in it that, that the, the commercial version has that anybody can buy. But of course, there's a handful of sounds in, in my version that are exclusive to this show. So obviously nobody else will have those sounds, but it's the same Backstage Pass anybody else can have. Um, and then along with, with, uh, with that, I run Logic, which runs our stems and SMPTE. Right now the track selected is our SMPTE signal that drives video and our click track. And so uh, as far as actually running things, I'm gonna show you an example. I'm gonna try to run the iPad with my left hand while filming with my right hand. So um, I can close the song just by hitting the escape key. And then I've got all the songs in order here on the desktop. Now we're not doing this many songs, but the first two columns are generally both halves of the, of the show. And um, Smitty will you know, typically have things in order, but we call him the king of wing because he will sometimes go off script and, and I've gotta be ready for anything. So the, the main question I get is, is everything in one file? And the answer is no, that would never work with Smitty because he's always changing things. Problem with doing everything in one file is say you have 20 songs in your set list, but you make a change to song number two. You know, you cut a chorus out or something. Well, it messes up then everything from there forward. So um, for that reason, and the fact that, you know, I've got an entire career's worth of Michael's music in the computer, I need to be able to have different versions of songs and so forth. So it's just much easier to have every song as a separate file. And then, uh, so people want to know, well, well how, do you, how do you do that? Really, I can't show you the iPad and the screen at the same time, but I've got a way of navigating it with the iPad. So I just go to the next song, open it, it opens. You just saw how fast it opens, less than a second, and it's ready to go. And of course I hit the space bar on the iPad, we're off and running. And uh, you know, as soon as the song finishes, I hit close, open the next song, and we're off and running. The natural question would be, you know, did you ever run into any trouble with that? And the answer is no, uh, logic 
is, gosh, I've been using Logic for 30 years now, and it's just um, flawless. You know, once you have once you have everything set up right and optimized um, for a touring rig, it really, really is rock solid. I shouldn't say it's flawless because no software is flawless, but if you know it well enough, you know how to set things up and, and how to optimize things. Um, it, part of it is just not asking the computer to do more than, than you should. You know, you shouldn't be running massive track counts. You shouldn't be running virtual instruments like Omnisphere or, you know, large contact instruments, you know, like, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, like an orchestral string library that's going to really tax the computer. Um, there are ways around that. So um, it's just a matter of, of uh, knowing your stuff and setting up your rig in the right way. But uh, so anyway, yeah, every every song different file. Uh, some are busier than others, um, but uh, a lot of times it's just click. You know, a lot of times I just open a click track, and um, and that's it. So that's the show computer logic on one hand and backstage pass running my sounds, and um, that's it. This particular computer is a 2014 MacBook Pro. It's a quad core i7 with 16 gig of RAM. It's getting a little long in the tooth. I'm waiting to see what Apple does here fall of 2021. Hoping to get a new machine soon. Um, but this one has been absolutely rock solid. It's also an older model which has a proper keyboard. I, I've got a new MacBook Pro or you know one that's about two years old, I guess. And it has a new butterfly mechanism, which is awful. It's, you know, it's a $4,000 computer and the keyboard, I'm afraid to look at it the wrong way. But this thing is a tank. It's a, it's a rock solid machine. It's got real USB Thunderbolt ports. It's got a card reader and it's got a MagSafe port for power. Um, these were the good old days. <laughs> and um, so that's why I've hung on to this machine for so long. It just runs so well. So, so that's the machine. So let's look at a few other things. Okay, next up are the stands. People have asked about these stands. This stand I'm using for the laptop is actually meant to be uh, an office desk stand, very heavy duty one, but um, I found it on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, it's about a $300 stand, it's very heavy. Um, it's hydraulic, you can raise and lower it just by squeezing that handle and it'll raise. But it's, it's really heavy duty. I like the fact that the laptop is really solid on there and um, I took the table off and made a, a smaller base for it but uh, you can see you know it's all metal and um, just a really cool piece I really like it I even like that it's open on the bottom so I can have my interface and other stuff down there and then the keyboard stand um, that you see here is not a keyboard stand <laughs> It's actually a custom industrial lift for um, a really heavy office desk. Um, it's made by a company called Tech 19, I think, or that might be the model. I'll put a link in the description as well for this. Um, I would not recommend it if you are, you know, traveling in normal musical circumstances. You know, if you're, it, it's not portable. <laughs> It, it doesn't really come apart. It's, you know, once it's built, it's built. You, you could take it apart, but that would be a pain. Um, it's about 65 pounds. It's very heavy. It's made of steel, and it's electric. The column here raises and lowers just by um, using a remote controller. Let me show you the controller here. Underneath my iPad right there is the controller that raises and lowers the stand. I don't actually use that during the show. Um, when I take the stand out of the case, uh, I raise it to the height I want, and then I unplug it, so it, it actually never moves during the show. But um, I really, really like this stand. Uh, it's very, very heavy, even though you know I've got a KX88 sitting on it, which is 65 pounds. This stand is capable of lifting 175 pounds, so it's rock solid. I can bang on the on the keyboard, and it doesn't wiggle at all. It's like a like an iron podium. So that was a good find. And of course, I like how it looks. I think it's nice and sleek. It looks clean on stage. It's got a cool look to it, and um, 
So it's probably my favorite rig I've ever had in terms of just the way it looks. You know, it's, it's, uh, I like the single keyboard on a stand thing. It's not complicated. I don't have a X brace stand where everything's wobbling and cheap looking. It, it just looks right. And it, more importantly, it feels right. It doesn't, doesn't move at all. And it does what I want it to do. Okay, so audio interface. Um, this is a Motu Ultralight Mark III. It's a hybrid uh, Firewire and USB interface. And I gotta say up front, I am not a fan of Motu gear. It's not my first choice. However, I have two of these and these particular boxes are the only thing I've ever had of theirs that has not let me down. And the only reason I went with these in the first place is because they are the only interface on the market, at least that I know of, that checks all the boxes for me. It's small, it's only a half rack space. It's made of metal, so it's very durable. Um, it has a lot of outputs. It's got 10 balanced tip ring sleeve outputs. So I don't have to use direct boxes. I can just use a TRS to XLR snake. And, um, you know, most boxes of this size only have anywhere from two to four or maybe six outputs if you're lucky. This one has 10. So it's a lot more flexible than others. Um, I like the fact that I can use it with Firewire uh, Firewire 800, even though it's an older protocol, it still works great. It's bus powered, so if I'm in a place where I need to be mobile and I don't have a, you know, power, it'll run off your computer's power. Um, and uh, so it's great for mobile work. It has a built-in MIDI interface, old school five pin MIDI, in and out. It has digital audio in and out via SPDIF. Um, what else? Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, so it just, it does everything I need it to do. Um, so despite the fact that it's Motu and, and every other box of theirs I've ever had has been a miserable failure at one point or another, this one has been rock solid uh, over several years. And until somebody else makes something like this, this is what I use um, and it, it works great. Um, I wish Universal Audio would make something like this. I love, love, love the Apollo series. I've got several of them at home in my studio. And um, we've got one on Michael's computer for his piano sounds. But for, for playing back stems and all that kind of stuff, this particular box is, you know, again, it's the only thing I've found that does what it does. So Universal Audio, RME, uh, Apogee, I wish that, that they would make something like this, but they don't. So anyway, so that's the audio interface. Okay, last but not least, this hideous contraption is a, I call it my cutting board pedal board. It's a cutting board from Target. It's like vinyl, plastic, very heavy duty. And I have mounted both of my pedals to this, not with Velcro, but actually screwed to the pedal board from underneath. Um, and what that does is it keeps the pedals from, first of all, from just being loose and flopping around in a bag. Um, all the cables are, are tied to the pedal board and it just keeps them reliable. Both of these pedals ha are at least 10 years old. This is a Yamaha FC7. It's by far the best volume slash expression pedal on the market because it's got a really wide range. Um, you know, if this is where you put your foot. You, you can get a nice wide angle out of it. Most pedals have a, a shallow angle, which is a lot harder to control your sounds that way. The, the wider the angle, the more control you get. And this thing's a tank. These have been around for 45 years, if not longer. Um, so I have several spares, but you know, again, this one's 10 years old. This is a Roland DP10 uh, sustain pedal. Probably the heaviest duty sustain pedal on the planet. It feels like a grand piano. It's really hard to push with your hand because it's meant for your foot. But these are built like tanks as well. They feel fantastic and they just work forever. So these two pedals, I, I can grab this whole pedal board. You can see my, my custom cable loom that I've got everything, all my cables wrapped in. So when that's disconnected, they just wrap around the pedals and I slip this whole thing into my carry-on bag in one grab. I'm not, you know, dealing with a bunch of pedals flopping all over the place. So that's my pedal board. Um, it's red, so I can see it <laughs> in the dark. 
uh, on stage. And um, yeah, it's, it's hideous, but nobody sees it but me. So there you go. One other little thing that most people don't ever see, they're not even aware of it. Uh, I'm a stickler for, you know, call it OCD, whatever. I hate seeing cables. I hate for the audience to see a rig that's got cables draped everywhere. So I'm really picky about having my cables wrapped. I get this nylon webbing that you can get on Amazon uh, or you know, any ele electronics supply store. I run all my cables through one. I loom them together and they are attached to my stand on the back side so that nobody sees them. When you look at my rig from the front, you don't see any cables. So all you see is the keyboard and the stand. It looks nice and clean. So you're looking at the back of my stand here, looking up at the underside of the keyboard. And I just wanted to show you that so you can see that it's, you know, it's done right. It's neat, it's clean, and it just keeps your rig looking nice and respectable, so. Okay, so uh, here we are two months later, uh, just now getting around to finishing this video. <laughs> we are now obviously on the Christmas tour with Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant. Um, anyway, that's what happens sometimes on the road, it takes forever to get things done. So I hope you enjoyed this look at my keyboard rig. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch, leave your comments below, and um, yeah, there you go. I hope this was fun. Take care, and if you're watching this at Christmas, Merry Christmas. See ya.